from the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Well, Sherry, if you're going to be that nice, you can come back again next week. We love you, darling. Have a wonderful weekend. All right, plenty to get to, including today. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer, well, didn't they have the swagger? Running around because the economy's amazing, everything's great, nobody's having any troubles. Because, yes, the unemployment numbers came out today. They do show that things are... Uh, the rate that had a four in front of it's back to having a three in front of it. But, of course, nobody talks about the underemployment rate in the country, which is at 6.6%. And, actually, the number of hours that people are working... Are down, but sh you know everything is awesome. But the reality of uh, what you've just seen with the unemployment uh, rate is, well, the likelihood of an interest rate cut happening anytime soon, well, seems to be being pushed yet another month down. Now, there's no expectation that rates are going to go up, but. Good news on one hand always ends up being bad news on the other. Now, I know and I get the emails from people saying you're always on the side of the people that are trying to pay off the house. What about the people with money in the bank? I get it. But, of course, remember, for anyone who has the average mortgage in this country of anywhere between uh, half a million and a million dollars, they're having to find something like fifteen to $30,000 extra than they did at the start of the Albo dozen run of interest rate rises. You also have to... Uh, factor in the number of people whose pressure right now is right at their limit. So is it good news that they're still right at their limit? No, of course you want them to come back from the limit. According to the Roy Morgan surveys, 1.6 million householders were in mortgage stress, and this is up from 1.6 that was there last year. So despite the fact that the Prime Minister will say we turn the corner, everything gets better, well, things remain very tight. But there's another bit of data around today that, of course, got no attention, but I'm going to give it right now. I want you to ask yourself, how many people do you think have got basically no money in the bank? And when I mean basically, I mean no money in the bank. A survey came out today from the consumer website Finder. Not quite the Pons Institute, but not quite the, uh, the Bureau of Statistics either, but still, it's important here, because they talked to about 3,200 people. And how's this? 45% of Australians have less than $1,000 in their bank account. Now, there are a huge number of Australians who, of course, go, uh, well, paycheck to paycheck. That paycheck to paycheck and the little buffer zone in between if they're trying to pay off a mortgage has basically been blown away. But there is some more data in this, that 9.4 million people in Australia have basically less than $1,000 to be able to fall back on. Now, if you end up with a major car payment, a major health payment, you need to get a new water heater because the current one goes bust, well, where's the money going to come from? Now, amazingly, one in five people have told the Finder organisation zero dollars in the bank. Now, that, if uh, it stretches out to the wider population, is about 4.2 million people who have got absolutely nothing. Put it all together, it's the best part of, what, 13 and a bit million people in a country of 27 million people who've got bugger all or nothing in the bank. Of those 9.4 million people who have less than $1,000 on hand, the average bank balance is just $210. So even the people we're talking about with $1,000 in the bank, they don't even have half of that. They don't even have a quarter of that. And that's barely enough to replace a flat tyre. The research found that three in four, 76% of Australians are stressed about their current financial situation, which is why I bang on about it each and every night. It's an issue where, as I say, 76% of Australians say their financial situation is tough. For millions of people, there's less than $200 in the bank, which is why a practical solution to giving people just a little, just a little more money when they've got none in the bank but they need it to keep their life where the expenditure keeps going up is for this government to cut petrol taxes. Remember when they came to government, it was just 23 cents in the dollar. They, of course, got rid of those discounts and instead have increased... They made a decision to do this. Increase petrol taxes now to 49 cents per litre. 49 cents per litre, up from 23 cents per litre. We have said it how many times, how many months, and this is supposedly the people that are in a position to do everything they possibly can about cost of living. So, Prime Minister, Treasurer, are you going to cut petrol tax? No, I... No, no, no. no. What a surprise. Now, also here, of course, uh, let's talk about Big Australia and the population issues. You may have heard this in other shows this evening. May I add to their great information you have already got? 
Clueless Claire O'Neill and her boss, Anthony Albanese, each way elbow, well, they announced in December, remember, that Australia was going to start to pull its head in about the number of people that were coming into the country. Now, I have to say this every time, because if I don't, somebody will misinterpret the conversation. Of course, I don't care from whence people come. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they believe in. As long as, wherever you come from anywhere in the world, you understand that we value gender difference, sexuality difference, religious difference. We believe that the laws of the land supersede any religious laws that you may well have. We believe that this is a peaceful country that gets along with each other and takes care. You don't pack up the old grievances of the past and play them out on our streets. But regardless of that promise in December, the streets are very full. And they are very full because of relentless immigration. Relentless immigration that during the same year where they took $1,500 off 10 million taxpaying Australians, they just bust in hundreds of thousands of more people. So in December, they say they're going to cut immigration levels. As we told you this week, in January, it ended up in a scenario where there was more than 125,000 people that came in in one month alone, the highest January since 2009. And as you've heard today, the overall population number, well, we've said it before, we've closed in on 27 million, and we are now growing at a 70-year high. Over the past year, the population has increased 659,000 people. The best part of 660,000 people. That's the fastest rate of population growth since Robert Menzies was the Prime Minister. Now, for obvious reasons, that's not babies, that's people being brought into the country. Now, to give you an idea of how wildly out of control the current settings that this government has put in place claim to have changed, but still the results are there. Have a look at this graph, which comes again via the Sydney Morning Herald using the data of the ABS. Now, you don't have to be a genius to work out that the annual population growth, which of course is people coming to the country, people being born in the country, pretty steady, starts to go up in the mid-2000s, obviously drops like a stone straight after the COVID years, but look where it is now. It is way higher than it has been in our history in anyone's recent memory, almost likely lifetime. And where do people end up going? Well, they don't go to regional Australia. They end up going into New South Wales and Victoria. You can see here the different colours. You can maybe squint and work out which your state is. But you can see that the vast majority of people, about 90%, are actually going into New South Wales and Victoria. But really, it's Sydney and Melbourne. Now, Erin Mullen's program, which is on Friday night, a must-watch, along with all of our other weekend programming, she had an interesting conversation with a man who, for the best part of 20 years, has said exactly the same thing about immigration. The former foreign minister, the former Labor senator and the former New South Wales premier, Bob Carr. His message couldn't be clearer, yet it is one that his fellow mates in federal Labor ignore so they can produce the financial results that mean they can run around in question time and pat themselves on the back. I've been trying to get Australians to understand that we do not need to have the highest rate of immigration in proportion to our population in the world. There's no other country doing this. Uh, we've got third world rates of immigration and we don't need it. Now, this is not some right-wing figure. This is not some sort of token xenophobia. This is not some sort of dog whistle on racism, it is about the number of people coming into the country. When he was the Premier, what, 20 years ago, he was saying Sydney was full. Well, since then, of course, there have been hundreds of thousands, probably over, well over, a million people that have been added to particularly Sydney. But it is a wider issue here, where the people who are running our economy are not doing anything about our society, our society that becomes fuller by the day. I just wonder, just wonder why this is the only economic model we've got to force feed population growth, to run the highest imaginable immigration intake and to condemn our big cities to a relentless chase to keep up in terms of infrastructure. We don't have to do it to guarantee Australia's prosperity. In fact, it's a pretty lazy way of running an economy. Couldn't agree more. Good to see him on the telly. Good to see him looking happy and healthy. Strength and love to him, of course, after his loss of his wife earlier this year. And Bob and I disagree on many things, but he's absolutely right on this. Because, you see, the more people that come in, the more pressure it is on state government and local government to be able to keep services up to standard. 
Now, of course, because taxation largely goes to the federal government, then it goes via the divvying of GST, you end up in the scenario that we're living now, where the places that are actually the focus of the population are not keeping the money that they are creating for the economy. Instead, they are supplementing other parts of the country, and particularly the political parts of the country, that Prime Ministers of both sides of the political aisle desperately want to keep winning seats in. But it also makes the point here, too, that if we are having this many people join us, it means that the hospital that you may well have opened last year, that you started building five years earlier, is only fit for the problem that was there five years ago. No state government instrumentality turns around and doubles the size of something on the assumption that the population will grow and all of these beds will need to be filled. Population strains matter because you can see them around you each and every day. You can see them when it comes to how hard it is to find a place for your kid to be able to go to school. If you're in a scenario where, for whatever reason, you move house in between the first kid and the second kid going to school, well, they don't go to the same two schools. No, one kid's got to go here, one kid's got to go there. And what family where two parents are working can do two different school drop-offs? So you have to yank one kid out of a school, put them into another. You get these are, these are the real issues for parents and grandparents. Right now, the hospital system, pick your state. But let's talk about specifically what's happening in Queensland. I mean, right now, what's happening in Queensland, what happened in South Australia, still is happening in South Australia, actually, is record ambulance ramping. Now, I talk about this every night because forget every politician who says, oh, we're doing something about the health budget. If the reality of the health system is that you call triple O, in Victoria, no one may turn up, the call may never be connected. A report before the last state election said 33 people died as a result of the failures in the triple O system. Oh, no, but still, a couple hundred thousand people, whack them into Victoria. In Queensland, people are waiting longer than they ever have in the back of an ambulance. People are dying as a result in the back of those ambulances. There was a story about it this week. Yet at this upcoming state election, the Labor government that's been there for way too long will turn around and say, oh, trust us on health. No, we don't. Again, the population issues matter because, as you're sitting in traffic each and every day, if you happen to be in Sydney, you're going to be paying big tolls. Anywhere else, you just sit in big queues. Now, every now and then, there are occasional... New things that are open, but they're always two lanes. They're never four. They're never six lanes because, of course, cars are terrible and evil. But millions of people living as we do, millions extra each and every year, hundreds of thousands of people that have come in, the best part of, what, three-quarters of a million in 12 months, all of these things become problems, let alone the people who want to try to find a place to live. Now, of course, there's the places that uh, may well be brand-new properties, but to people who have just come in, they can only afford to rent, they try to stand in a queue as long as this, paying way over the odds of a property that isn't good enough. How many times do I have to tell people that in Ipswich, beautiful Ipswich, I love Ipswich, love River 949, shout out to Drew and all my mates there, 150 people apply for every single rental property that's available, let alone the costs of actually being able to one day buy a house. And believe it or not, the Greens have helped us with a little bit of data here. There is not a single city or region across Australia where the average housing income earner can afford to buy a house. Now, the Greens asked these questions at the Parliamentary Library. It found that the average annual income required to buy a house and not fall into housing stress... Read the question I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Well, that number is now $164,000. You need to earn $164,000 before you're not going to end up in mortgage stress if you want to buy anything, and I mean anything, in any of the capital cities in the country. The average wage in Australia is the best part of $80,000. So even if two average wage earners got together, they still wouldn't be enough, let alone way higher, particularly in, again, Sydney and Melbourne. Now, if you wanted to buy an apartment, it's $130,000, but that has now got to $186,000, for people in capital cities. So those two people earning an average wage together, still, they can't get there. Yet no one talks about it. And if they do, they talk about it for a day, then they roll on and, oh, look, shiny thing over here. Look who's getting married. I don't care. What are you doing to make things easier for people? Oh, well, we've decided to uh, uh, make a childcare subsidy easier. Okay, cool. What about for the people who don't have kids? Uh, Shut up and pay your taxes. Now, as we know, this weekend, the, we will work out whether or not the final Liberal government in the country will fall or it will be able to get another term in Parliament. 
Now, Jeremy Rockcliffe is the Premier who was forced to go to an election after his own MPs then became independents. The independents said that they wouldn't back him, so he went, bugger it, I'm going to go off the people. And fingers crossed they'll give me what they gave Will Hodgman, what they've given previous Premiers as well, and I will end up with a majority. But the problem is that this government, in order to keep itself alive, has agreed to have more people into the parliament, which means more seats means we lower the threshold for the number of people who are qualified to get into the parliament, making it even harder for the government to be able to get a majority. Meaning, is the whole election process worth nothing because, in the end, it's somebody you didn't vote for who's in charge of everything? And I certainly don't envy the choices that are there for people in Tasmania. Now, again, I'm not going to pretend to know the ups and downs of every single thing that this government has done. But if you're even thinking about the opposition, why would you? I mean, in the People's Forum that just happened last week, uh, sorry, a couple of days ago, the Labor leader is saying, I will renegotiate the stadium package with the AFL. Who have you been talking to at the AFL? Oh, I'm not going to tell you. Well, what will the renegotiation be? Of course, it's nothing. It's just the thing you say to get through an election. But if the Tasmanian Devils are going to exist and 100,000 people have bought the $10 memberships and they expect to play, they expect to play in a stadium that will have a big chunk of public funds in it. If there's no stadium, then there will be no team. Because another part of the detail around the Tasmanian team is that the Tasmanian taxpayers are going to be spending millions of dollars a year to keep the team viable and that's nothing to do with the stadium which is why that 100,000 members is an interesting insight into what may or may not happen at the upcoming election on Saturday. But as for the latest polling, and because the system they use is the Hare Clark system, where essentially regions of the state have a vote and X percent of that region equals X percent of Team Red, Team Blue, Team Orange, Team Green MPs. They don't have electorates, single-member electorates. They have multi-member electorates. Means we'll be in for an interesting night. Andrew Clonell will be there at 6pm on uh, election night. And this was the latest polling that he had going into it, saying the Libs are looking good. They're looking like the one that'll end up with the most seats, but they're not going to have enough to get a majority, which means who you don't vote for will get to decide who the next Premier is. This is the current state of the House. 11 8 four, two. Here's the polling. 35 seats up from 25. 14 to Liberal. Four to Jackie Lambie Network, who don't even have a presence in the Parliament. That means if the they Liberals can convince time, point out Jackie, Jackie Lambie. La if the Liberals can convince Jackie Lambie to come into a coalition, they have a majority. Otherwise, they have to have four different independents or the Greens. So, the big factor here is, will Jackie Lambie be able to do what previous Senate power brokers like Nick Xenophon promised to do, but of course didn't? Now, Jackie Lambie uh, can automatically suggest that she will get re-elected. She was able to get her staffer re-elected at the last election because of the vote that she gets in northern Tasmania. The size of the population means she doesn't have to have that many votes, but she is relentlessly reappointed by the people of northern Tasmania. And those four seats that are likely to come, come, of course, from her... Jackie Lambie Network, which is all about Jackie, it's all branded about Jackie. She's claiming to be the one that'll be in the negotiations, despite the fact that, of course, she doesn't have a role in the state parliament, but still, people like the idea of Jackie Lambie's style of politics, no matter how frustrating the rest of us may find it from time to time, because, of course, she's always good at complaining. Not amazing at being able to deliver, but if you're into complaining, she seems to be the one. And I wanted to show you something that showed kind of how empty the offering is, but it's one that will be appealing to people because, well, I'll get to that in a second, but this was the ABC last night. It takes a lot of time, effort and courage to run for public office. And to win, a little bit of luck helps. An independent hasn't been elected to represent Braddon in the lower house of the state parliament for over 100 years. So let us talk about the Lambie factor. Senator Lambie isn't on the ballot paper, but her face and her influence is everywhere. Uh, she's the leader, right, so we, you know, we're going to be listening to her. Uh, she's been in here for 10 years now, or close to, you know, so she's got some experience behind her. We should be listening. But she's not, she's not going to be um, the autocratic, hardcore you know, personality. Now, Lambie has the Harry hits because the Liberals have been talking about the fact that the Lambie network doesn't have any policies. And if you think that is just a random hit from the Liberal Party, have a listen to the candidate themselves admitting they don't have any policies. 
So we haven't already got pre-decided policies or you know, specific areas. And that's, to me, that's true democracy. Here we are representing the people. P pure democracy? Now, again, maybe their model is, and previous people have gone to elections suggesting that vote for me to become your local MP, and on every issue I'll put a poll up on a website, they'll decide which way it's going to go. But they're openly saying, as the kingmakers of the parliament, that there are no key standards that need to be met. Now, the Liberal Party may well have made quite a significant political miscalculation by trying to go after the emptiness of the Jackie Lambie network, because the person who will be doing the negotiating, if the polling is, as it seems, where the Liberal Party needs the Lambie numbers to get to a clear majority, well, they'd, of course, have to deal with Jackie Lambie, who's previously said no to the stadium. But again, is that negotiable? The deal with the AFL seems pretty clear. Would there be compensation if the stadium had to fall over? You betcha. Hence why Brisbane is having an Olympic Games. Hence why uh, there's half a billion dollars of compensation when the Victorian government pulled out of the Commonwealth Games. But she's really angry at the Liberals for pointing out what their own candidates are admitting on the ABC. I just think, is Jeremy Rockcliffe doing this for a reason? Because actually Jeremy Rockcliffe never wanted to be the Premier. We all know that Jeremy Rockcliffe's ready to leave. Um, has he done this on bloody purpose? But more importantly, I think I find it really hurtful because I've known Jeremy for a really long time. Now, again, politics is always local and sometimes politics is always personal. And you end up with scenarios where blood feuds are there because you did me on this or you dudded me on that. But it is a strange negotiating position from the Liberal Party when they would need somebody else to keep them in power. Jackie Lambie has previously shown that she's willing to give preferences, uh, as she did in the last election, to uh, Bridget Archer in Bass, who's a Liberal, but then, of course, she gave them to the Labor Party in Braddon. So she's willing to sort of straddle both sides of the aisle because it ended up with better political support for her. And that's fine. That's politics. I get it. But it does seem very weird that the Libs would try to create an issue about the people who they may well end up going cap in hand to to become the next government. And given the fiery nature of the lady I've affectionately called the crazy cat lady from time to time about Tasmanian politics is going to be fun to see. But in the same way that there are candidates in the field saying, vote for me because vote for me, Jackie Lambie is telling people before they vote on Saturday... I won't tell you which way I'm going to go. If Labor ends up with more seats, do they guarantee to be the first people to form a coalition? Is it the Libs because they'll have more seats? Or is there no way the Libs get it because she's opposed to the stadium, she doesn't like the behaviour of the Liberal Party in its tactics during the election? Well, again, Jackie Lambie won't answer. Those candidates will have to make their own decisions at that table. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to sit there and mentor them, but I've got to stay that step back. I've got to find a very fine line because I need these guys to grow as quickly as possible. So it's all about you, but it's not about you. Vote for me because there's no policies, but that's ultimate democracy. Enjoy Tasmania. Oh, yeah, but one little footnote. The Hamburglar's back. Remember the Hamburglar? Affectionately known because of what she was wearing on the day when the former... Hobart Lord Mayor decided to move from the Liberal Party ranks and the clear majority that was there for the party at the time. And then, of course, with the help of the Greens and Labor, she was able to use their votes to become the Speaker of the Parliament. Now, amazingly, she is recasting history here, that it was the Liberal Party who moved away from her, not her moving away from the Liberal Party in order to become the Hamburglar Speaker of Tasmania. I give a commitment to the people of Tasmania that I will not be destabilising the government of their choice. I'll be working with them to perfect and make sure that the pledges they make are upheld. Really? Because you were elected once as a Liberal and then because they wouldn't make you a Minister, you sided with the Labor Party and the Greens to become the Speaker and we called you Hamburglar because it was that brazen! Good luck, Tassie. Results, 6 o'clock here on Sky News on Saturday night. I will be watching, and I can't wait to see what happens. Meantime, in Queensland, old Giggles Miles, who, of course, is laughing about youth crime, despite the fact that he said, I wasn't laughing about youth crime, but he was laughing after he was asked a question about youth crime. OK. Who, of course, uh, said he was going to knock down the Gabba, then rebuild the Gabba, but then realised that it was unpopular to do so. So he turned around today, uh, this week, and turned around and said he's not going to knock down and rebuild the Gabba. Instead, he's going to spend a billion and a bit dollars on a stadium that takes a long time to get to. <laughs>
a long time to get to. It'll be kind of temporary, and we'll have a world-class athletic track after that. But as the Courier-Mail showed today, it takes like two-hour round trip on public transport to actually get there. In fact, their reporter uh, took a camera, had a look, and, uh, yeah, this is the experience of what it actually takes if you don't want to drive to the very stadium. Now, there is no plan for a brand-new train line. In fact, the Premier himself has said that the grand solution to the two-hour public transport ride from the visitors coming from around the world will be more buses. It's likely to be a rapid bus interchange, but I want to work with City Council uh, to see if there's a way, for example, for it to integrate into their, um, their metro system. <laughs> wow. How long have you got to put up with this bloke? Please, Queensland, please. Well, guess what? There's no money for that. And Grace Grace, who's the infrastructure minister, has openly admitted there's no money for the extra bus thing to get to the half hour stadium that Miles wants to build. Direct quote, at this stage, we haven't funded it. But of course, public transport is something we need to fund in line with our budgets and we'll certainly be looking at that going forward, otherwise known as no idea, no idea, but we're definitely going to have an Olympics and it's definitely going to be awesome and everyone's going to be fine. And one Antonio Samaranch will rise from the grave and say, this is the best Olympics ever. Oh, my goodness. Seriously, they think you're that stupid. I know you're not. Tell your friends, tell your family, flush them, get rid of them, please. I'll lend you the brush to get rid of the stain. Honestly, these people, they are beyond frustrating. Now, uh, the Matildas, we all love the Matildas. Uh, we learnt today about what their uh, prospects are going to be to go for a gold medal at Paris before Los Angeles, before Brisbane, uh, of course, at the Olympic Games. We learned today that they are in Group B. Not an easy group because they're up against uh, the US, Germany and there's also going to be an African team that's going to be in there as well. Now, tonight we're going to have a chat to uh, Nigel Farage. We'll talk all things Trump, about what it was like in and around that interview, about what he thought in the reaction to all things Kevin Rudd. But there is one heck of a problem that is sitting over the top of Donald Trump right now. Now, as you know, there is this ridiculous court case which was decided really before there was any opportunity to really argue about it because it was pretty obvious they wanted to get Trump. This was the court case where apparently he overvalued the assets that he had before he got a loan from a bank. He paid back the loan from the bank and the bank had no problem. Oh, no, no. But a third party, that being a elected Democrat, stepped in and turned around and said, no, no, this is fraudulent, this is disgraceful. And, of course, a rather wacky judge, remember when he was posing for the cameras? When he was posing for the cameras and basically had found him guilty before anything had started and here he was, oh, my moment in the sun. Sort of like the O.J. Simpson judge, but clearly not as interesting. Well, he ended up putting a scenario where uh, he has to pay an awful lot of money, despite the fact that he is appealing that decision, an awful lot of money which has to be paid by Monday, American time. Have a listen to the number. Breaking news of a new court filing showing former President Trump is facing insurmountable difficulties in obtaining a bond to pay a nearly half a billion dollar civil fraud judgment. The judge ordered Trump to pay $355 million plus interest after holding him liable for a decade's worth of business with fraudulent financial statements that overvalued his real estate holdings and hyped his wealth. Now, he has to pay. He's trying to get a whole bunch of ways to get there, but a lot of people aren't willing to give him the money, not because he's not good for it, but because, of course, if they go into business with Donald Trump, oh, oh, oh how dare you, insurrection, terrible, evil, Hitler-esque. So, of course, they don't want the rage, which means he's going to be in a scenario where if he says, I can't pay by Monday, the judge will turn around and start to say, OK, then, cool, um, let's start selling stuff from underneath you. Bloomberg put together a series of what they think his properties are actually worth. This was reported by CNN, so we're using their graphics. About half a million dollars in one building, 270 in another, 175 uh, in another one, in the one that, of course, he lives in, $160 million. That does seem cheap, certainly for all the gold, if nothing else. And, of course, the house that he actually lives in, because, you know, they should go for that. For a loan that he paid back and the banks had no problems with, that's $40 million. That is what is likely to happen. But there is a silver-ish lining which is, if he's able to offload it, believe it or not, Truth Social and the bit that he owns is worth a huge amount of money. Now, the court is not going to allow him to turn around and say, well, I 
show you how much Truth Social is worth. But Truth Social, apparently, his stake in it, he could sell it for $3.5 billion. But on top of all of that, regardless of whether you like, loathe or whatever Donald Trump, I've got to say, if you or I had a half a billion dollar bill hanging over us and it's due on Monday and you know they're going to start calling and selling stuff from underneath you or, I don't know, making you go to jail until you pay it, would you be as cool as a cucumber as he was in that interview with Nigel Farage? I find that astonishing. We'll talk about that with Nigel and a whole lot more in a moment or two's time. Love to know who you think the winner and loser of the week is. Jump onto our socials. Alas, we're not on truth. Or you can always send me an email, paul at skynews.com.au. Thanks for watching. Big Thursday night, one for the hard course. And I should mention, no sooks, no lefties. Told you, no sooks, no lefties. Standing by for Nigel Farage in London. The second he turns up, we'll have a chat to him. In the meantime, well, they are the main course. He can be the dessert a little bit later. None other than the wonderful Caroline Marcus, our colleague here at Sky News, Michael Kroger, knows a thing about elections, of course, via the Liberal Party in Victoria and our mate in Melbourne. So, Paul Keating ends up having the side meeting after the meeting with the Foreign Minister and, of course, had his little side meeting there with the Chinese Foreign Minister. Now, the statement that uh, Paul Keating put out was all pretty generic, um, but the statement that the Chinese put out seemed to be a little more favourable about what uh, Paul Keating was telling them about how China's not a threat, China's pretty much amazing. Everything is awesome. James Patterson, of course, the national security representative of the opposition, he doesn't like the idea of the real government and then the whatever the hell Paul Keating is. And for him to agree to meet with Wang Yi and for the Chinese government to make a request for him to meet with Wang Yi is a calculated humiliation of the government here in Canberra. He has been incredibly unprofessional and undiplomatic in the way in which he's commented about the foreign minister in particular. Uh, now, Caroline, again, uh, I suppose anyone can meet with anyone they want. Former Prime Minister is eminent, but there really is only ever one government at one time. Certainly the way that it works in the United States is literally when an outgoing president may well have been defeated by somebody. So, say, Trump in 20, um, well... You know, they're the government right up until uh, the new government is sworn in, so there's not the, the ability to sort of play two sides. Um, obviously, China trying to send a little message because the way it all gets interpreted back there is former Prime Minister agrees with us, everything is awesome. <laughs> yeah, and look, this, this is a very strategic move by them. This wasn't, let's just catch up with an old maid of ours while we're in town. They know how humiliating this would be for the government because it, Paul Keating has not only been obviously extremely pro-China, but he has been, as James Patterson pointed out, really critical mm. of the government over its relationship. And Penny Wong in particular, he singled her out as being mindlessly pro-American. This would be absolutely embarrassing for them. So it's achieved that goal for the Chinese. And they, they play these sort of mind games all the time with countries. They try and destabilise well, and do. cause rifts within it's the government and within a party, and they've achieved it. Yep, correct. They always end up uh, winning, regardless. And, of course, if you, God forbid, stand up against and say, hey, about that thing that ruined the entire world's economy and killed millions of people, shh, don't mention it anymore, mm. right? Um, but obviously, Michael, uh, in poor Keating, there's somebody who has a different worldview, and that's fine. Everyone can have a different worldview. But when the government has to come out and say, he has no power over us whatsoever, but in the same week we learn <laughs> that two of his least favourite people are no longer on the National Security Committee, uh, hard to argue. Mm. God love him, Paul. God love Paul Keating. Lucky you. I mean, we've had to put up... All of my adult life, I've had to put up with the fact that the Liberal Party... We had my dear old friend and mentor, Malcolm Fraser, who was very good to me when I was young, but uh, later on in life, Malcolm became a thorn in the side of the Liberal Party for all of his life, as everybody knows, famously even standing on the back of a truck with Gough Whitlam, arguing for the independence for the Fairfax Press, of all things... And then, of course, more recently, we've had, uh, we've had Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, Labor's former prime ministers and former premiers tend to play the game and know that it's not the done thing to criticise their party. So, mate, thank God for Paul Keating. He's the first uh, former Labor premier in my lifetime who's turned on the Labor Party. And, um, you know, he's doing, he's doing a wonderful job. And it just reminded me, of course, of that great, uh, that great comment he made to Mark Latham years ago when, uh, I think it was in Latham's book, where he said he met Keating once when he was the Labor leader and uh, Keating said to him, you know, mate, us maddies have got to stick together. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think he was right then and he's right now. now so, let's, God love him. Yeah, let's mention, uh, again, like a broken clock, I suppose they can be, no, not even once, twice a day, maybe once a 
three years. But the Greens have got this information out about how hard it is for people to buy a house. Now, again, hardly breaking news, but still we start to see some numbers here. Average earnings in Australia are about $80,000, right? Um, if you're going to be uh, going for a unit, it's $130,000 that you need to earn to be able to get into any capital city, right? Let alone the one you may well end up living in. And of course, it's going to be the best part of uh, you know $200,000 if you're trying to get into a house. Again, I know that there's no breaking news here, but I keep talking about housing because I think the Greens are going to do with housing what they did with the environment 20 years ago, which is that the, the want to appeal to renters is how they're going to wrap all the other garbage that, uh, that comes with them. What do you think? Well, yeah, I know. I, I know you've been talking about that a lot, but I think people have to be smart enough, surely, out there to see that they can't... They're, they're, still just a party of protest and they can't actually do anything significant to change the reality of the situation. I mean, they can badger the government about, you know, doing things about negative gearing, but I don't think that's going to change overall what's really happening. And I think a large part of it is going to have to do with, obviously, immigration numbers, and that's not something that the Greens uh, really have gone hard over. But yeah, it is shocking, some of the figures that have come out today, that show basically outside of really Perth and Darwin, people who are on single incomes and average incomes cannot afford basically even a unit Both without great severe cities. mortgage stress. And if I could take the man cave there, yeah. I would. But I know you love Darwin. I love Darwin. It's fantastic. <laughs> but seriously, you haven't already, go there July the 1st. You can blow stuff up. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. Um, <laughs> but also, so let's get to Tasmania here because I don't, I don't want to cut this conversation too short. But Michael, um, Jackie Lambie, right? Okay, so we know that her brand is particularly strong in the north. We know that she's going to get a bunch of seats because she is endorsing whatever her version of politics is. But her own candidates are openly admitting they don't have any policies. But conversely, the Libs are trying to spit in her eye when she could be the easiest path to forming a government. Do you think when push comes to shove, she goes with the most number of seats or, given that she's going to want to put one in their eye, I mean, this sort of licorice all sorts coalition could well be built, Labor, Greens, couple of independents and Lambie, and Rockcliffe's done. Mm. No, look, I don't think the Labor Party can, can have a coalition with the Greens under any circumstances. Uh, and I don't think they will. Uh, they might take uh, a guarantee of confidence on the floor of the Assembly and an agreement not to vote for, uh, vote against supply. But can Labor get into a coalition with the Greens after the Greens' disgusting sort of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish performance over the last month or so? I mean, the Greens are... They're toxic. Um, they, 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 they're, they're hatred um, of... Um, of, of Israel and so many of their their members who prominent people like that Jennifer Long Leung who have made no. very anti-Semitic anti-Jewish comments just disgusting. I mean, can can the Labor Party afford to let it be known nationally uh, that they are in a coalition with the Greens? I mean, there's a lot of Jewish people who have historically voted for uh, Labor. Uh, they will lose every single vote and probably lose Melbourne ports. Uh, and the independent will lose um, uh, Turnbull's old seat uh, um, if they get into any coalition with the Greens whatsoever. So that's why I don't think a, an all sorts Labor government is possible. Um, you, you know, what is mo most likely is that Rockcliffe gets, you know, um, load mid teens, 13, 14, and that he gets to 18 by a couple of Lambies and a couple of independents. I think that's the most likely outcome, mate. Yeah, this is the thing. The, the licorice all sorts are a whole bunch of independents, including people who have been expelled from the Liberal Party or expelled from the Labor Party. Um, there's lots of mm. different ways they can mm. get there. Mm. But, Caroline, I, I've got to replay the candidate on Channel 2 last night openly saying, yeah, we've got no policies. So we haven't already got pre-decided policies so, or you know, specific areas. And that's, to me, that's true democracy. Here we are representing the people. True democracy <laughs> is, I, I don't know, uh, you tell me once we get there. It's Marbo. It's and the vibe of the it. thing. It's the vibe of the thing, Paul. But that is confidence like... when you know, as long as you've got the, the right hat, the right name and the right person next to you, you don't have to have an idea. You don't have to offer solutions. You just are there, as Jackie is in the federal parliament, to point out what the problems are all the time. Oh, does this stuff work in Tasmania? I, think, I, I can't imagine that it would. I and yet, she, I mean, she's so popular that maybe they can just turn up and be like, hey, here's Jackie's face on my T-shirt. 
shirt, vote for me. We don't have anything other than that to offer you. I don't believe Jackie Lambie for a second when she says she's going to stay out of any negotiations. Course, that, I mean, course. the party is literally named after her as if she's not going to be telling Which, of course, what ironically, to make. was when it was Clive Palmer. She wanted to get away from there. So it's, it also all depends on how finely balanced things are and about whoever the major party is that tries to get in there and split a couple of people off from someone. Oh, don't take orders from her anymore. You're your own person. Anyway, all of that tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. All right, winner or loser for the week, Caroline? Winner, I think, Trump and Nigel Farage for getting those amazing comments. And conversely, Rudd has got to be my loser of the week and those new explosive comments that we saw on Shari earlier of what he said. How can he possibly stay on as ambassador if Trump gets back in? I can't see how. Correct. They are a ripper. All right, Michael? No, Rudd will be gone by March 20 next year. He cannot possibly survive if uh, if, uh, uh, Donald Trump wins. And the winner of the week... Uh, Cameron Stewart wrote a great article in The Australian Today uh, explaining how Rudd has been trying to get in suite with all the people around Trump. And the Australian newspaper, the, the winner was, is the sub-editor who led, who, who led with Make Kevin Great Again. That was the name <laughs> of Kevin's campaign. <laughs> so I thought, Make Kevin Great Again, uh, Trump, etc. So that sub-editor at the Oz did a great job. You are the winner of the week, Mr Anonymous. Or Good Mr. Stuff. Anonymous. Thank you, guys. Do appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. Nigel Farage joins us. What was it like to be there with Trump yesterday, particularly that stuff in and around Kevin Rudd? But again, just how cool as a cucumber the bloke is when on Monday he has to pay half a billion dollars and he says he can't get access to the cash. More in a sec. Nigel Farage, our mate from GB News, the man who, of course, the great Brexit leader, part of the Reform Party in the UK, so many titles, but let's just say friend. And he joins us now after that crackerjack conversation he had with uh, the former president yesterday. And now, before we get to anything else, again, I just mentioned it before. On Monday, he owes half a billion dollars to a court. This week, he sits down with you. If it was you or I who owed that money and we knew the hammer was coming down, we'd either cancel the interview or we'd look a little different. He looked like he was going to be getting half a billion dollars, not having to hand it over. (laughs) Do you know, he walked into the room, cool as a cucumber, we said hello, we had a little private chat, we had a laugh and a joke at Piers Morgan's expense, we (laughs) talked about a variety... (laughs) Oh, irresistible. Um, And we had a chat about a few things. He sat down, uh, the cameras were all set, we did the checks, and he says to me before we go live, he says, uh, OK, Nigel, he says, let's have some fun with this. Um, we do the talk for just over half an hour. We cover, you know, NATO, uh, a world at war, the economy. Uh, we touch on the legal cases that he's fighting. We, ha- we um, discuss Kevin Rudd. We'll come to that in just oh, a moment. Yeah. Um, and after we finished, he gets up and... Uh, and the, he, he does photographs with all the camera crew. He meets people. He's smiley. He's happy. He makes their day. Um, and off he goes. I, I mean, I, you know, I've never known anybody in my life with that degree of resilience. It is truly unbelievable. Now, uh, when you asked him about Kevin Rudd, it was pretty obvious that as soon as you started to read the rap sheet on some of the things that he'd said, that even if he had long forgotten the name, uh, he was going into a certain pile. You can tell when somebody gets life from Trump, and we saw it before our very own eyes. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the fact is that uh, you cannot... I mean, particularly given the AUKUS deal, you know, particularly given this very close relationship now in military terms and equipment terms and nuclear submarines that exists between Australia, America and the UK. And, hey, it's a really important deal, particularly for Australia. It really matters. Uh, you simply can't have somebody uh, as your ambassador who is openly, willfully abusive. And to call him a traitor, I mean, you know, I, I, I actually love the way Trump responded to it. You know, he won't be here long. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, and it does bring into question the judgment of the Australian Prime Minister. You know, to send someone there when there's a realistic chance of Trump winning, what on earth was Albanese thinking?
Yeah, uh, 100%. Well, obviously, we'll all uh, know that uh, between November, the transition team between uh, uh, November and January, I think that may well include some of our representation, uh, if uh, Trump ends up winning. Um, I can't also help but not mention in the conversation that there is a frustration we've talked about in the past, which is when compared to the uh, presidency of Joe Biden, his candidacy is really strong. As soon as he starts reaching back into the greatest hits, particularly in and around what did or didn't happen around the ballot boxes of 2020, uh, I think he does himself a disservice. I know that he's right in the middle of all these things and he's got so much incoming, but when you've seen him, say, out and about on the stump, when you sit down with him, is there that little part of you that says, yeah, I mm. get it, but, you know, it's about tomorrow, not yesterday? Yeah, I mean, look, he and I have had some disagreements over this. Uh, I warned them all. I warned them all in August of 2020. I said, whoa, if you're going to have mass mail-out ballots, I said, we've got plenty of people in Britain who've gone to prison since we started that process. Uh, you know, you've got to make sure state by state it's secure. The work wasn't done. Some states have cleaned up their act, uh, but not enough have. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, you know, the point I've always made is that the kind of people he needs to win are people who've got a job, a mortgage, a dog, 2.6 kids, you know, and they're living their lives. Yeah. Um, and, of course, they want to have trust in the integrity of the system, but their priority is, what are you going to do for me? Their priority is stopping criminals coming over the border and ruining their districts. Their mm. priority is their monthly bills. So, yeah, I, I, I have to say, I, I do rather agree with you there, though, you know... Having seen what mass mail-out ballots do, oh. having seen how open they are to, to, to fraud and corruption, I get it. Yeah, this is the thing. It's not an unsubstantive point. I understand about what he's talking about, but in terms of the comparison, I mean, one of the best things that you get when you are a politician who gets to go away for a little while is people get to remember, right, uh, uh, and get to cast you differently. When you're there all day, every day, um, you've got to make sure that, again, you've got this opportunity. And I think the more yeah. he focuses on that, the better things go. But that said, leading in the polls, including in the swing states. Now, let's talk about, uh, yeah. well, your country and ours. Uh, of course, today we had the Defence Minister and the Foreign Secretary, Defence Secretary and Foreign Secretary in Australia signing new deals to, well, I would have assumed this paperwork was already done, but to even tighten the relationships. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, this is, this is all what I'd hoped for. You know, as members of the European Union, in foreign policy terms, we were very, very tied. We tended to do things at an EU level, uh, and now we're completely free in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and I'd always hoped you know, that our real friends in the world, and by that I mean Australia, apart from cricket, obviously, mm. uh, you know, that we were able to strengthen those relationships. And, and, Paul, it's happening before our very eyes. It's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, you fought for the whole idea, for England and for the UK to be able to make its own decisions, not to have to double-check mm. with Brussels, not see if whether Macron's OK with it. And, again, that's all playing out before our eyes. Thank you very much for chatting with us, uh, well, so late in the week. We'll talk to you again Thank early you. in the week next week, mate. Somebody will start talking. We're mates. Lovely to talk to you. See you later. Thanks. Nigel Farage, you can see his show on GB News. It's on the Flash app. You can find all of the highlights, of course, uh, at YouTube. And we will be tomorrow night uh, in the 9 o'clock hour replaying the conversation with Donald Trump and Nigel Farage. Highlights of that at skynews.com.au. Quick break. Back with more... All right, that's us done for the week. Thank you very much for all of your support. I really do appreciate it. Don't forget to keep spreading the word about it. Pass around... Uh, the highlights before, of course, the internet becomes censored. You can do that at skynews.com.au, YouTube, podcast, all of that business. Sunday night, special edition. It's our town, but it's one with a difference. We're doing one in and around Sydney, and we're going to Balgala on the northern beaches. Now, we've got a full room, which means the only way to be there is to watch us. And today, I spent a bit of time on the golf course, and I was amazing, of course. Like, just the best ever, right? Thank you to Tim and Flora for being very patient. Um, I'm looking forward to that. We'll celebrate lots to do there. Also, you're going to meet an incredible Paralympian who is just... Could you imagine marathon uh, efforts, literally a, a marathon, like 40 kilometre long chair ride? Well, you'll meet her and a whole lot more. So see us on Sunday. We'll comment on the news. Go Yankees. Go Tigers. Have a great weekend. Here's the late debate.